So again, welcome. And, you know, deeply honored to have Nick here. And I have to say that there are few people in the world, you know, kind of who I truly admire as much. And the reason, it's very simple, is so many people have great ideas. But who has great ideas and actually has the energy to work 20 years and more just to implement and get them to work? And Nick and I share something in common that is a deep respect for law and the subtlety of the legal mechanisms. And what it makes, I think, also this event so unique is that we can hear your vision of how the law can be embedded into computer science and its tools and then made available to society at large and to combine the scalability of purely quant processes over computers in the same way as law has some mechanisms and make them available across the world. So eager to hear your vision and you know feel free to shock us and just excited to listen. What do you have to say? Thanks. Thank you very much. Today I'm going to talk about blockchain, smart contracts, cryptocurrency. And so we can start out by asking what are smart contracts? And the definition back when I coined the term way back when is around these lines. A machine programmed with rules, rules that we could have defined in a contract, but instead we perform or verify the performance uh, with a machine. And so, for example, you could imagine implementing the conditional logic of this is a, a old-fashioned 10 US cent Coca-Cola machine, and you could imagine implementing conditional logic uh, in, a, in a contract of the kind. If the party of the first gives the party of the second two nickels, the aforesaid party gets a soda. And if the party of the first puts in a quarter, they get back uh, a nickel, a dime, and a soda. So you can, could in theory put that in a contract, but of course in this sense, sorry, that's at you, it makes more sense to put it into a machine. It's very well defined. So I call, um, I call a machine that does this a smart contract that has, has code in it that's inspired by a contract or can perform the function that a contract can perform. And so you can, there's other definitions out there. Um, two or more parties agree to run software between them or one party running software, the blockchain. And the most, one of the commonly used definitions here, number three, a blockchain process that handles money in blockchain titled assets and uses, again, conditional logic to do that. Um, these are also called distributed applications, dApps, or fiduciary processes, which kind of is a somewhat better generalization than smart contracts to describe that broad thing. And so what are the relationships between these smart contracts and traditional law? You can think of a smart contract like the repo man is a security protocol that controls the burden of lawsuit. So when the repo man takes a car, that shifts the burden of lawsuit from the creditor, the person who owed the money, to the debtor, the person who owed the money, um, to if either one of them thinks that, that the transaction was unfair. And so if possession is nine-tenths of the law, I don't know how 20 got in there, it's supposed to be 10, um, then a cross-border blockchain-based smart financial contract may be 99% of the law. Um, it's just so much more automated and efficient, and as I'll get to, than, than law, especially in a cross-border context. And in a financial context, is, is low-hanging fruit for smart contracts because they're very well defined. Um, do smart contracts need to be legally enforceable? Um, that's sort of like, I hear that question a lot, it's sort of like asking the courts need to examine the guts of a vending machine to figure out what the parties intended. You'd probably actually want to look at the user interface, did it say 10 cents? What, what is the expected interaction with that machine? Um, smart versus traditional contracts continued. Um, so smart contracts are rules and conditions analyzed and executed like in the vending machine um, today, of course, by software. And I call that dry code. It's interpreted by machine. 
Whereas if you think of traditional law or traditional contract in that sense, it's verbal, text on paper, text on computer, but it's all meant to be interpreted by humans, and in particular interpreted by lawyers, because these days, who reads contracts but lawyers? So um, <clears throat> you can think of what code is, or that contract, long contract you read as a, as a computer program or in the brain of a lawyer. So some dry rules are analogous to contractual terms, thus smart contracts, the term. Others are more like rules from property, corporate um, documents as deeds and charters, from statutes or regulations. So you, you, if you wanted to be uh, more accurate in your metaphors, you could use terms like smart property, distributed autonomous organizations, even smart laws. So, why this is a, gives the uh, the uh, contrast between a, a fiduciary, a trusted person is defined as a fiduciary in the law, somebody trusted with your money, or a fiduciary process, a smart contract. And I'll get into more of the differences later, but one of the big basic differences, and the public blockchain has the money, it has to treat it according to the rules it's programmed with. Um, the fiduciary has, has human choice, and because they have human choice, we have this uh, threat of them going to prison if they don't give you your money back. So in the cases where the rules are simple, the, the rule, the machine that has to follow the rules is going to be much more reliable and secure than the, than the idea of coercing people with jail. So. We want to secure a wide variety of desiderata. So traditionally, when we think of security, we think of securing one thing. So we're going to put a lock on our door to prevent people from coming in. That's like one thing we're preventing. We're going to encrypt our messages to prevent people from reading them. And that's really only one thing that we're preventing. Um, so with smart contracts, you can secure a really wide variety of things that you can define in computer programs. Um, so you think of the costs of the problems it's addressing as the cost of trust and security, especially across borders, different languages, different laws, different jurisdictions. Um, smart contracts can be particularly effective in that context when you have a clearly defined relationship that you can find. So, so the broader definition of the security here is vulnerability minimization, minimizing your vulnerability to having to trust other people that, that might not really be trustworthy. So we also call it trust minimization. You'll sometimes hear the buzzword trustless. Um, that's sort of an exaggerated way of saying trust minimization. Um, financial transactions. So for example, a financial transaction minimizes the need to trust a fiduciary, a human institution, for its integrity. It's uh, a good example of trust minimization. And part of the breakthrough of blockchains was recognizing that trusted third parties are security holes. So I worked at a um, when they defined the public key cryptography um, standards um, in the 1980s and 90s, they had this thing called a certificate authority that was kind of this magical trusted third party that everybody else had to rely on. And so while the rest of the system was very efficient and, and low cost of cryptography, that became a huge bottleneck to the point where at the height of the internet bubble in 1999, there was a company, VeriSign, that was one of the leaders in certificate authorities and at that time, their market valuation was several billion dollars simply based on them being a bottleneck um, in the system. You can think also think of a certificate authority as you have to go get a license to use cryptography or get a license to be identified in the cryptographic system. And, still a multi billion dollar Yeah. Well, they do other things now, too. Um, it's a little, a little bit more competitive now, not, not super. So you must be plugged into a highly evolved institution of blockchain to really make this work. And basically the blockchain is, is a, a computer, a distributed computer I'll get to that substitute for a trusted third party. And so the, a basic thing you want to do in security, um, and really in securing relations in general, including laws I talked about, is you want to minimize trust assumptions. Um, and lawyers face this themselves, you know, people say, oh, you can trust me, why do we need a contract? That, that means you don't trust me if you need a contract. So you can also say that about smart contracts and security. You know, why, why do you need all this? You can trust me. Uh, so sometimes people get insulted when you talk about this stuff. Um, decentralization per computer science is much more automated and secure than traditional security. So kind of the basic idea and basic thing a blockchain does 
is it will um, substitute for various things accountants do, investigators do, and lawyers do, automated rules on the blockchain. So you can think of the army of accountants and lawyers and investigators there on the left, and an army of robots with green eye shades there on the right, and the green eye shaded robots are engaging in a computer protocol where they're checking each other's work. Um, they're using cryptographic um, techniques to authenticate. The, it's called the Merkle tree. Create a chain of unforgeable or post-unforgeable uh, transaction history and ledger. And so another bit of history about how centralization is insecure. This is um, from the beginning of the 20th century, early 20th century, industrial um, technology had produced a lot of very centralized institutions in society. So when a bunch of mutinous soldiers and, and workers, um, led by uh, Vladimir Lenin and Leon Trotsky, wanted to um, topple the democratic government, it wasn't the Tsar's government by that time, it was a democratic government, or at least trying to be, and all they had to do was take over a few uh, major institutions. So, so uh, radio stations, they only a few radio stations in St. Petersburg and Moscow, and you could take those over and take control of what people heard. Um, only a few newspapers, mass-produced, very expensive industrial-type newspapers. And so you only had to take over a few of those, and you could control what people read. And railroad stations, take those over, and you can control where people go. So those are what the communists took over and uh, toppled the government. And so we have a version of that in computers today. Computers today are based on this thing called root. And if you can crack root in a computer, you can do all sorts of havoc. You can be an insider who has root access anyway, and a lot of these so-called hacks are actually that. They're actually insiders. They won't tell you that. Or it can be an outsider who's cracked into the machine and, and uh, broken root. So this is an example of JP Morgan, a multi-billion dollar identity hack. So what it means is that in computers today, pre-blockchain era computers, security is very dependent on law enforcement. They're, the security protocol is basically, oh, FBI, we got hacked, come help us, please. And it makes them very um, dependent on law enforcement and makes, puts financial systems in these national silos that it's hard to break out of. Um, when you, Switzerland has a very good cross-border finance culture, but in most parts of the world, um, you'll go and talk to people and they'll just talk as if, you know, U.S. law is universal law. It's the only thing you have to worry about. Or, you know, other parts of the world act like that as well. And so, <clears throat> we want to do better. We want something that works all over the world, same rules, and that's what a public blockchain does. They're public and global. So Bitcoin, you can see all the nodes there running around the world, and uh, it executes the same, same transactions everywhere. And ditto with Ethereum on left end. So Bitcoin is an older system. It's uh, seven years old now, and contrary to the FUD you'll hear, legal in the vast majority of jurisdictions. And it's been running, it's basically the most reliable um, financial information technology ever deployed, and deployed most widely of any information technology ever deployed. And so on the right, um, Ethereum, it's a newer system, it's more advanced, it makes better performance security trade-offs, and best of all, it's a Turing complete computer. So if you go back and think of Steve Wozniak, if you remember your computer history working at Hewlett Packard, and he decided to go off and build this thing called an Apple computer, and it was a full-fledged computer. So he'd been working on these programmable scientific calculators, which had their niche, but once he created a full-fledged computer, that is a much bigger, much economically more valuable thing. And so that's what Ethereum's done with the blockchain. And basically everything that Apple's, just about everything Apple's produced ever since, where it's called the iPad, iPod, whatever they call it, phone, um, it's a Turing complete computer. Because that is just the economically by far the most beneficial kind of, I don't know, crash. Uh, <laughs>
All right. Let's go for a little review. Okay, so let's talk about geopolitical security or insecurity, as it were. So for a long time, uh, for since ancient uh, Mesopotamia, silver was the standard, um, and through various parts of history, silver and or gold has been the two main monetary standards. And before that, shells, I wrote a whole article about shells, they have a nice shell exhibit here. But uh, you can think of these shells and gold and silver and so forth as collectibles, and they have certain properties that make them better as money. They're compact, you can store them on your person, and uh, so forth. So the Aztecs, um, before the um, coming of Columbus and the conquistadors, had um, took gold as tribute from their tribes. And they also used gold in their markets. They had gold dust, and they used gold dust as money. Um, so whereas in the West, gold is jewelry and gold is coins were used as money, um, the Aztecs used gold dust. But the same basic properties of gold, its compactness, its scarcity, and so forth, uh, make it a more secure and reliable form of money, but not secure enough. As we shall see, the conquistadors came along and looted the Aztecs, who had in turn taken their money as tribute from the, the native tribes. And later on, Sir Francis Drake, over here, uh, looted the Spanish, jumped ahead in history to the 20th century, and you'll hear a lot about various economic excuses why the gold standard ended. Um, when I read my history, I see that during World War I and World War II, the British were um, sinking a big proportion of British um, ships going overseas. So if you think about how the gold standard trust system works, you have to have a gold window. and People can go to the gold window and cash in their banknotes and get gold. And when these guys are running around, your ships are going to the bottom of the ocean. It becomes too expensive to ship the gold. Your gold windows run out of gold. Your gold standard is no longer trustworthy. <clears throat> So the U.S. briefly revived a gold standard of sorts during the Bretton Woods era from uh, the end of World War II to 19, roughly 1970. And it was an era of more stable prices since then. If you look at commodity prices, especially strategic commodities, geopolitically strategic commodities like oil and phosphates, which is a very interesting um, commodity, the volatility, the prices of those just goes tremendously after the end of Bretton Woods in 1970 and the last end of the gold standard. So let's talk about cryptocurrency a little bit. Um, Merkle Trees, Ralph Merkle in the 1970s, um, along with co-inventing public key cryptography, came up with the idea of chaining hash functions together to uh, form trees. And a variation on this is secure time stamping so that um, you can take it and get a specific order of things coming in, um, each one stamped after you know, So You have a, a partial order where you always know something in the tree came in front of something before it. And also in the 1980s, Byzantine consensus um, was invented. And this is a way of replicating data widely and sending messages so that you assume that some of the nodes are always going to be malicious and attackers. In fact, um, various versions up to one third or up to 50, up to half or 51% attack, and that's where that comes from. Um, so they did this. The, the, the interesting part of that was that Byzantine consensus was based on really a single computer with multiple processors, of how it started out. So they just assumed that you could identify what the processors were and that processors were not faking each other's identity. But when we went on the internet, that assumption broke. And I'm not sure even today a lot of computer scientists realize that that assumption is broken. Um, you cannot um, just assume identity on the internet. Um, it's, it's a terrible assumption to make. So, and then in 1990s, we had the probabilistic revolution in computer science where in, in certain Byzantine consensus, they proved a bunch of things were impossible. But they're impossible in the sense that you can't do them with absolute certainty. However, it turns out you can do a lot of them with astronomically high probability. And so that's what the probabilistic resolution, revolution was about. And so um, 
Alongside that, and along with the uh, public key cryptography revolution, came digital cash. And DigiCash, David Chalm's idea was a, basically a privacy enhanced cash through a thing called blind signatures. And then PayPal wasn't trying to do that, they were just, uh, no, there was nothing interesting about their protocol. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> anyway, um, interestingly enough, DigiCash in its early days had a, it was a totally toy and just for you know, beta testing. Uh, private currency. So um, I was working there at the time. We set up this little gambling thing that paid out more money than it, it actually took in, contrary to what most casinos do. And it was just a way of, of distributing this currency and having people learn with it. But we always thought of it as a toy. This is a very centralized system. Um, to make it really work, you'd need a, a really strong bank with traditional controls, and even that would be a mess. So. Uh, Anyway, and that's what PayPal, so that inspired PayPal's first version. They were going to do a private currency, but they quickly decided um, that's probably just a recruiting gimmick or something. It didn't go very far. Um, but it would have been centralized too had they done that, just like their system is uh, for regular payments. So then we come to a mailing list I was on called LibTech, and Weidai and myself and Halfini and a bunch of other cool people are on there. And so we came up with big gold, be money, and secure property titles. And so I'll describe um, secure property titles. It's basically a Byzantine consensus system. So it still had that flaw that Byzantine consensus has. Um, but it was a Byzantine consensus system for keeping track of who owned what informatic piece of property. And so one of the pieces of property you could own were the solutions to these hash puzzles. Um, and hash cash, which was later used in Bitcoin, had already been invented, so that's what I was um, proposing to use there. And so you'd have these uh, strings of, of uh, solutions, basically, and keep track of them with secure property titles. So you can think of this as uh, vaguely similar to what a, some of the private blockchains architectures are today, um, but used for, for creating a cryptocurrency. And so those are the first two, BitGold and BMoney, the first two decentralized cryptocurrency designs. And so, but those are all just designs. And so, Miracle along comes along Bitcoin in 2009. It's a full-fledged system. It's um, interestingly fairly mature, when it, in, in some ways at least, when it appeared. And revolution, that, that just caused, you know, BitGold and BMoney and all that stuff was done in utter obscurity. No one knew what we were doing, but Bitcoin, of course, went to the moon and became famous and all that. And then another interesting thing is that when I talked about the more advanced technology Ethereum in, in I guess just last year they released. So, so I want to talk about an interesting problem in, that we have in the cryptocurrency community. And that is that um, you can send Bitcoin around the world and Ether around the world all you want. Transaction costs are pretty low. But just try to exchange it for, for fiat currency, and you run into Mark Karpolis, you run into money laundering regulations, you run into all sorts of um, incredible, uh, I shouldn't swear that you would run into, you wouldn't run into just using Bitcoin and Ether. So this is uh, a piece I think would greatly economize on that. And that is, let's say you're trying to move money across borders. And normally when people think about it, it's like a remittance. It's going from one person to another person. We have to exchange it on each end. Or it's going from an importer to an exporter, and they have to exchange it on each end. If instead you could get a regular flow, counter flow, going each direction, importer to exporter, person paying a remittance to a person paying a remittance, or another importer to exporter, then you can actually cycle. And these are called tellers. And um, based on the Abra Teller um, terminology, they're doing what Abra Teller does, or lo or their local bitcoins um, <coughs> dealer also does. But so instead of going and having to exchange fiat for ether all the time or fiat for bitcoin all the time, you just have this run around in a cycle. So let's see if I can. So here you have the payment here. It's going to the teller. Um, the teller is going to do also a payment here, not necessarily simultaneously. There'll be some pool here of accumulating funds. And they're going to send some Bitcoin over here um, to this teller. And then the teller is going to pay exporter. So the importer, the exporter, 
none of these guys have to ever see anything but their own fiat that they love, and it's the tellers that are exchanging uh, Bitcoin. And the beautiful thing about this cycle is this is just going around. There's no Bitcoin fiat exchange involved. It can just keep going around and around. And so you're getting a lot, of, a lot more use out of your money than if you kept cashing it in. <clears throat> Okay, and you're conserving on, a, on the most expensive part of the cryptocurrency uh, ecosystem, which is the fiat exchange. Okay, so we did this. We uh, um, Cryptocurrencies, of course, are based on this, um, based on blockchains technology. Um, geopolitically insecure finance. So let's talk about some other geopolitically. We talked about... Uh, Gold up here, a very useful form of money, but also very insecure. And these are the modern, modern examples. So recently there was the Ukrainian-Russia dust up, and Ukrainian holding the treasury bonds, um, they didn't feel it was trustworthy to hold them at the Federal Reserve anymore. So they cooked up a scheme, I can't explain it all to you, but it end, they end up holding their U.S. Treasury bonds in Switzerland. And Switzerland's a nice, um, neutral, trusted third party. It's been a long time for history, and it's a big part of why there's a, a financial industry and why Swiss have so much finance and specialization that going on. The Swiss has been a neutral country, and people from all over and all sides during the Cold War, for example, felt comfortable um, using Switzerland as a trusted third party. Um, whereas they wouldn't trust each other, and in this case, Russia not trusting the United States. And so Goldman Sachs, the United States company, um, collateral for their depository receipts, et cetera, they had to put up hundreds of millions of dollars more collateral, and Visa and MasterCard had to put up hundreds of millions of dollars more collateral. So this distrust between countries is in incredibly expensive. And again, Bitcoin and Ethereum cut right through that. Um, it works the same in Albania, Zimbabwe, Argentina, Russia, China, does not matter um, if some miners don't trust other miners and so forth. <clears throat> Even all the intense squabbles we have over the block size in, in the Bitcoin community, and Bitcoin's still chugging along, merrily along. So, um, global finance machines. So, uh, so another way you think about these things is we're entering the era of the global finance machines, where um, not just cryptocurrency, cryptocurrency is a huge part of it and the core of it, um, but the smart contracts dealing with that cryptocurrency just will enable us to do a whole bunch of uh, financial transactions up to and including mimicking um, the behavior of, of traditional financial instruments. And it doesn't depend on jurisdiction, politics, law, it works seamlessly across borders. And so of course Bitcoin, a geopolitically secure currency and, a th and asset Title transfer, and uh, it's what our hosts today are um, doing, is secure registry and title transfer, um, taking advantage of that. And it's geopolitically secure computer for Ethereum, and that, that will allow a really broad array of financial instruments. Um, and other, I'll give some other examples here of things we could or might be able to do with uh, Ethereum. And so here's a look at Ethereum network nodes. So there's several ways to look at this. So decentralization, you can count the nodes, of course, but that has some flaws, especially with, um, now I talked about the civil attack and not being able to identify people. The flaw with counting nodes is that people do insecure things like run a bunch of nodes on an Amazon instance. And that counts as one node, because Amazon can control those. And you're not adding to your security if you're putting one more node on an Amazon instance. So there's a lot of fakers and frauds out there that don't understand this, that pile up a bunch of nodes and, and uh, count them. So a better thing than counting nodes is to look at the diversity <coughs> of nodes. And one simple way, there's a lot of good ways to do that, but one simple way to do that is you can just look at a map here, and you can go, oh, we got one in the Seychelles Islands here, we've got some in Southeast Asia, Indonesia. Um, you've got a lot of diversity, South America, North America. <coughs> both the United States and Russia, as well as China. So there's a lot of diversity there, and that's the real strength of these public global networks. <clears throat> um, so what, what, another way you can think about this in traditional financial terms is um, a accounting principle called separation of duties, 
Where if you think of, for example, in a traditional movie theater, you've got the guy who sells you the ticket, the person who rips the ticket, and so they've got, why is this extra person ripping your tickets all day, since they're ripping tickets? Well, it's actually a control protocol so that the person can't, you know, just give away tickets um, to people. Um, if they give away tickets, if the cashier just gives away tickets for people, that will be detected because there will be less tickets ripped and you'll know uh, something's going wrong and you reconcile these at the end of the day. So you can think of um, blockchains, part of what they do, checking each other's work as a huge separation of duties where you are distributing trust around rather than putting your, your full trust in a particular party. And a crucial part of that is independence. If the ticket ripper colluded with the cashier, they could fool the system. But uh, you, if you can assume they don't collude, then you've got a nice protection against fraud. And usually they don't collude. So in this case, since so we've got such diversity around the world, um, we can be much more confident that all these um, nodes and miners are not colluding with each other. So smart contracts, examples and patterns. So I'm going to do dispute mediation, um, so-called oracles, a terrible name, but that's what they're called, input from a fallible world. You think of oracles as being omniscient or divine or something. In fact, the oracles are the, are the weak link in the, in the smart contract system. And smart property, um, talk about seals, spaces, locks. There's all sorts of interesting smart property ideas and proplets. And uh, assurance contracts is a nice, simple example of a smart contract that you can get your head around. And I'll do a thought experiment, which you can't get your head around uh, insurance, and show kind of the limitations of where smart contracts are right now, how far, how far or not so far they can go. Um, so dispute mediation. Um, this is a really simple one. So there's this thing called multi-sig. It's signature authority. You need, in this case, two out of three um, signatures for the transaction to go through. So what happens is the parties put up their uh, money into an escrow, one or both of the parties. They do some performance. It can be a performance off the chain, on the chain, you put the evidence on the chain, there's various things. But in it, there's a, a human mediator here that is going to check this performance and release escrow funds along with one of the parties. <clears throat> so that's a very simple combination of old style um, mediated human mediated contracting and, and smart contracts. And so, talk about oracles. Um, and basically you're taking input um, from outside and using them to do contracts. For example, you can take prices and use them to create swaps and, and contracts for difference. Um, you can take you know, weather data for prediction markets or called parametric contracts. And so basically, um, people gnash their teeth about this. It's kind of a weak link in a smart contract. Really, I think the most practical and good solution is there's a lot of traditional sources of fiduciary data. You know, six here in Switzerland, Thomson Reuters do really good stock prices. Very reliable, been doing it for a long time. Um, birth and death certificates. <clears throat> um, also, not that you can't improve on these and clean them up, but uh, it's not the magic bullet that, or not the huge advance that, that smart contracts themselves are. Okay, so cryptography can protect the integrity of transmission from source to blockchain, so that's a really good help. Um, you should make sure your um, stuff is using hashes and digital signatures properly. Protect the integrity of transmissions. Um, fraud usually happens at the source, unfortunately, though, so cryptography can't protect against that. The LIBOR scandal manipulating the market itself. You know, if you can manipulate the market prices as they're being formed, you know, the, the cryptography and putting it on the blockchain really doesn't help you because it's already been messed up. And same and the same goes for kind of any kind of forgery. Blockchain is not a magical solution to prevent forgery. It prevents forgery once you've committed it to the blockchain. You can't change your mind and say it was something else. Um, it doesn't protect you from making stuff up and then putting it on the blockchain. So <clears throat> Smart property, seals, tamper evidence spaces, proplets, locks, we're going to talk about some of this stuff. So locks, there's a company called slock.it that's doing very interesting things about locks driven from the blockchain. So you can have smart contracts or a smart property deed protocol on the blockchain that, um, for example, lease, for example, you can lease a bike and it will unlock the bike during the period of the lease. 
I'm not giving it justice. The, the, there's all sorts of things they're experimenting with. Um, it's very, very interesting stuff. And seals are very interesting. Um, a time-honored thing, these again go back to ancient Mesopotamia, where they sealed things in clay. It creates a tamper-evident um, enclosure or barrier. So here we have a tamper-evident door, where if you open it, it will, it will uh, leave a tape mark. It's very hard to get rid of. Try to sand off the tape mark, you'll see where you sanded it, so it's very tamper-evident. And this is a tamper-evident bag, this is an evidence bag used in police, but I used these when I was setting up a certificate authority for uh, cryptographic key cards that we use and needed to store away securely. Banks use them for all sorts of things, most obviously cash. Um, so, and of course, police evidence rooms. So these have serial numbers, and so one of the things you're doing is you're sealing this up and you're recording the serial number as you seal it up. And a pretty straightforward thing you could do is put that serial number on the blockchain so that um, you cannot tamper, you cannot tamper not only with the evidence bag, but you can't tamper with the information that's been recorded from, from it either. Okay. And so spaces. Um, one way to do tamper evidence spaces, of course, was this guy right here. But another way is our good old friends, the laser, laser block. And again, you can hook these up to the blockchain and do really sophisticated um, security based on, on property and contractual things you've agreed to. So this is a scheme I came up with um, a long time ago, and today I would, I would use a blockchain such as Ethereum for it. And these are proplets, so they look to the blockchain to see who owns them. And so this would be for like a machine, like a, well, any machine such as a computer or, a, or an engine that depends on its firing sequence. And so you have an entanglement that works kind of like a lock that you could 3D print that will make the firing system dependent on having a code. And nuclear bombs work um, a lot like this, that you need a special sequence, a code to set them off. And if you don't get that, just physically it doesn't work. And uh, so you can design various machines using 3D printing technology to do this and have them, the code has to come from the blockchain. So again, you get the blockchain um, take control of the property and then the blockchain is keeping track of the deals people are doing and who owns what and so forth. All right, so current, one of the current projects I'm doing, uh, financial assets on the blockchain. Um, so one way you can do this is what like he's doing, of course, trust minimize token transfer and that secure property titles and colored coins. Um, incredible technology you can do a lot with. And what we're doing is complementary to that trust minimized cash flows. So um, once you have the financial asset, how do you trust somebody to pay you? Well, we've, we've actually trust minimized that and it's a pretty, pretty cool thing. And recent projects, social networks plus Ethereum. So, this is a um, change chip uh, type of thing, trying to do a decentralized change chip. So, hey user Bob, 10 Ether, is, this is uh, designed using Ethereum just to take advantage of the Turing complete blockchain. And so here we have, um, this is their Ethereum address, this is their balance. Um, and these are the social network accounts. So we've got a red, Alice has a Reddit account, a Twitter account, um, the blockchain ties these to a, to a blockchain address and a balance, and ditto for Bob. And so here on the social network, let's say Reddit, um, Alice can type uh, pay user Bob 10 Ether. And you have these Oracle bots, and they're scanning the social network for these commands, and they will execute commands in the blockchain. So basically, think of the social, this creates a social network. It lets the social network be a user interface to the blockchain. So you already have a social network where people are gathering. So an interesting thing about this is people used to have clubs. And at the clubs they would chat and do the things you do in a social network right now. But another thing you had in the clubs, you had a club treasury. And you could put money in and pool money and the club could buy stuff. And so that's missing from our social networks today. And this would allow you to add it. Um, so. And there's a lot of other interesting smart contracts things you could do as well. And kind of how this would work is here's the user with the browser. Um, 
doing what's called an OAuth, a web authorization to the Oracle bots and to all of them, and also to the social network. And this kind of unifies the identity. And then the Oracle bots are in charge of, of uh, manipulating this stuff and keeping these accounts proper. <coughs> And so you can do lots of things, um, not just payments, but um, more complicated transactions. Whatever you, whatever you can define in a user-friendly language that people would use on a, on a social network. So here's a really simple example of a, a, a kind of smart contract 101 example um, that we can use today. Um, there's a lot of things that work like this. Kickstarter works like this. Um, Groupon works kind of like this. And it's basically many parties send a transaction to an online blockchain pool, to an on-blockchain pool. So you're keeping a pool of funds on the blockchain. The blockchain code keeps track of the total. Um, when the total exceeds a threshold, the funds are distributed to a beneficiary. Um, if the contract expires, um, without that threshold being reached, the funds are returned back to the donors. This is a basic structure called an assurance contract that, that's really, really simple to implement. And to think about, you know, those are just a few few lines of code. Uh, now, this is much more complicated. In fact, at this point, pretty much impossible. We'll go through a thought exercise um, just to see how far we can get. So, let's try to do some insurance. So, insurance pays into a blockchain pool, um, like with our assurance contract. Um, the insured makes claim. You know, I've had been damaged according to such and such rules. But now we need a human claims adjuster, kind of like we needed a mediator, we had a mediator before, we're going to have a human's claim adjuster decide if the claim is invalid, the amount of damages, uh, if they decide, or it could be a group of claims adjusters also, or it could be a review process. Damages released from pool to customer. Um, so benefits. It's public, transparent, and, oh. it is public, transparent, and auditable. The payments work seamlessly across borders, and we don't need permission of a middleman. Business between the claims adjusters and the insured. Um, however, problems, trustworthiness, and the laws governing claims adjusters, the current system is pretty highly evolved to have an incentive, reasonably incentive compatible system for claims adjustment and for the laws governing that, and we're kind of throwing that all out with this. And who sets rates and based on what actual criteria? What criterion, the, the underwriting. We've also totally ignored that issue, and of course, how claims adjusters are paid, we've ignored that. So, really, we haven't got very far. <laughs> um, but it's an interesting exercise to go through to see how far you can get. Um, so, underwriting can be pretty subjective a lot of times. There's a lot of mathematics involved, but there's also a lot of subjectivity. <clears throat> and claims adjustment is often very subjective and controversial. So we don't, we don't know how to do claims adjustment with uh, Watson or deep learning or any of that stuff. Probably not anytime soon. Okay, wet. So I'll talk about the distinction I talked about before, wet um, or traditional contract or traditional legal code that runs on the brains of lawyers versus dry code, smart contracts runs on computers. Um, so reasoning method. Um, the law proceeds by, um, it's very subjective. And it proceeds by analogy. The favorite form of um, legal reasoning, especially in common law countries, is this set of facts is more like this set of facts and this set of facts. Therefore, we uh, fall into this category. There's, you can actually think of technology a lot. A lot of examples happen like that. Um, Uber. Uber started calling themselves Uber Cab. That was a really long, wrong legal category to put themselves into because taxis are a monopoly in most places, a legal monopoly. So they switched to ride sharing. We're just doing ride sharing like you do for, you know, sharing a ride for a commute or something. And that legal category wide open, and lo and behold, they're competing well with taxis based on finding this other legal category. So that is, you know, analogy. What is Uber most similar to a taxi or to ride sharing? Um, and software grounds on Boolean logic and bits. So it's a very, very different kind of reasoning. Um, the security law. 
Um, it's basically cops with guns, and if you're in contempt of court, which can happen even in a civil case that doesn't involve any criminal thing or imprisonment, you can still go to prison for being in contempt of court. And so that's what the security ultimately grounds down on, are these threats, threats of punishment. And software grounds down on replication. Um, the Bitcoin blockchain and Byzantine consensus are based on making lots and lots of copies of things. Um, and sending messages very redundantly across the network. And it very much relies on that. If you hear somebody trying to compare a blockchain to the web and saying, well, you know, you can do a web server with one megabyte and it's no problem, blah, 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 so why can't you do a blockchain that way? Blockchain is sending out um, many, many redundant messages. Um, so, and its security is based on that. So, it's, it's, you're never going to get anything that's really a blockchain performing anything close to what the web or other traditional transaction systems can perform. Um, and that's the trade-off that, that Satoshi and other blockchain um, people have made. Well, it's a trade-off Satoshi and, and the people who were inspired by Satoshi made, not necessarily the people who talk about blockchains today, um, is that it was a radical decrease in, um, a radical increase in computer costs due to mining just radically, radically increased the computational costs of a transaction. And <clears throat> the replication, the, the um, broadcasting of many, many messages redundantly also is required for the security. And that greatly increases the, the networking costs and decreases the performance. So yeah, you can have a, a insecure, not, and all that is bought for the security and the integrity. That security and integrity is what makes possible that it works the same in Albania and Zimbabwe and Russia and China and the United States and doesn't depend on law enforcement. You don't have to call the cops for the security. It depends on the computer protocol. And that comes at a huge performance cost. So there's a lot of people um, in business who they only look at one thing, um, transactions per second, and they go on and on about that like it's the only important thing. If that's the only important thing, you need to be using Visa and PayPal and stuff. Those are optimized for performance at the expense of security. Those are, those are call the cops. It's your security protocol for those. So if you want to have that um, universal um, computer and not law, traditional law-based and global rather than local security and integrity, it comes at that high performance computational performance costs. But we have Moore's Law. I mean, it's really cheap. I mean, Bitcoin transactions typically only, still only cost pennies. And uh, the transaction system we're developing in access, a market order costs less than one basis point per market order. So computational costs are ridiculously cheap. Satoshi made an incredibly good payoff. The people who obsess about transactions per second at the cost of security and integrity, they're like, um, Saving pennies at the cost of thousands of dollars, it's a really terrible, terrible economic trade-off. <clears throat> so, <coughs> security, that's security. Um, let's go to predictability. Um, law is very flexible. Um, in some cases, whimsical and corrupt. In other cases, flexibility is good. In any case, that's what it is. You have human judgment, human bias, human corruption, human whim, human wisdom. Um, very flexible. Uh, software is very rigid. It's going to follow the rules. You know it's going to follow the rules. Um, with public blockchains, Ethereum, you know it's going to follow its computer program. And anybody anybody who um, can read that computer program can go and audit it and satisfy themselves as to how it's going to run. And nobody can tamper with that. Uh, maturity. So law is highly evolved in many cases. Um, software is very larval. We have few experiences. We still don't know what, what the most valuable smart contracts are going to be. Um, so a law puts things in the local jurisdictional silos. You got people in the United States who think United States law is the law of the world. It's the only thing you have to worry about. Um, a lot of other people, other parts of the world are going to differ. Um, but even in other parts of the world, you have, people tend to think of law locally. I think Switzerland's one of the few places I go where people pay a lot of attention to overseas law because you're doing a lot of overseas business. It's the nature of your economy. Um, on the blockchain, independence from financial and political institutions and seamless operation across borders. Lawsuits, they involve armies of lawyers, especially these cross-border um, lawsuits. Um, usually armies of lawyers. The individuals really have a hard time participating in any, any even playing field in a cross-border sense because 
you're going to be facing an army, army of corporate lawyers in some other jurisdiction that doesn't speak your language and doesn't have your laws and so forth. Um, software costs are extremely low. They're automated, and they're getting lower. And this, this difference is going to grow. Um, once you automate something, it can go to preposterously cheap very quickly. OK, dry code. And dry code can push hard, harsh presence in the case of unanticipated exceptions. It can do, do some harsh things because it's very rigid. Um, anticipating edge cases. Um, so this is a trade-off. The anticipating edge cases is a trade-off made both in traditional law and in smart contracts. So when you have more conditions, you have more complicated code. And this could be wet code, too. This is the trade-off in both areas. Um, and more reliance, rely, reliance on fallible external data. So the more complicated you get. But if you get fewer conditions, then you all of a sudden, for any interesting things, you all of a sudden have to invoke human mediators. And you're back to the high expenses and uh, less predictability of, of traditional law, traditional human institutions. And sort of the extreme example is an employment contract where you basically punt on trying to predict or anticipate conditions at all, and you let the boss decide whenever something comes up that needs a decision. So, lessons from our thought experiment about trying to automate, make a smart contract out of insurance. So it takes the best advantage of blockchain. We need to use the best of blockchain tech, which are public blockchains, the global ones I talked about, um, with the best of traditional finance, claims adjusters, stable investments, so forth. There's a whole bunch of traditional finance that is still quite viable, and you can, the best solutions are going to be those that combine, combine the two, rather than trying to make a pure blockchain solution. Um, it's not going to go very far, usually. And uh, traditional finance is is going to make any progress. Uh, finance industry people who want to operate with crippled blockchains, they're, they're wrong. They're trying to cr recreate the banking cartels with these groups of, of uh, permissioned. You have to ask the banking cartel for permission to join their private blockchain. And so, of course, they're going to keep charging the rents they charge now. Um, and purists who think we can do everything with a public blockchain, that's also not going to get very far. OK. So, our, let's go through another lesson here. Uh, smart contracts on blockchains provide plumbing for financial assets, aspects of services, which can seamlessly cross trust boundaries, such as national borders. I mean, there's a lot of trust boundaries in the world. Um, national borders are the most obvious ones. Um, so smart contracts are going to provide the, the low-hanging fruit, the applications that are really well-defined for smart contracts are going to be like a global financial plumbing. And we're going to see that emerge in the next few years. <clears throat> um, smart contracts don't solve wet problems, such as claims adjustment, estimating risks, um, so forth. Um, certainly uh, not by themselves. OK. Traditional law is manual. Um, it's local, often uncertain. Um, I've been here. I've been one of these law interns. <coughs> Flipping around lots of <coughs> um, Public blockchains are automated, global, and pretty relentless in their operations. So that's, that's your trade off in your contracts. Um, so, in conclusion, smart contracts, the great granddaddy of all smart contracts, was the vending machine. Putting your dime, it, it computes what change you get. Um, we are now in the era of bringing up global financial machines. You can put your Bitcoin in in Albania, Zimbabwe, Philippines, Russia. And it'll operate, this vending machine will operate anywhere. You put your cash flows in, you get your cash flows out. Um, so you can, we'll be able to implement just a wide variety of, of financial interactions. We'll be able to mimic financial securities and so forth that way. And the thing, big thing to keep in mind with smart contracts is wet versus dry code. Each one has its strengths and weaknesses, and we'll, we will find out what, in the coming years, uh, the niche is for each one. All right, thank you very much. So, judging from the people who have been here, I mean, we have kind of two camps. A few real computer insiders who know the ingredients, so whenever you've been used slangs, I'm sure they want to ask, and what do you think here? And then another group of people who really come from the outside world, come from the world of finance. 
And so there are two very different set of questions. And at least I find always a very basic question. What gave you the initial inspiration to actually go and delve into it? Because, I mean, your dream goes back many, many years. What prompted you? It's partly political, so um, we had a group of people who had read authors like uh, Frederick Hayek and a Ayn Rand and, and so forth. Ayn Rand had this idea called Galt's Gulch of an independent um, capitalist system, um, that you could create your own pure capitalist system. And so this inspired several people, among them Tim May, to uh, come up with this idea, we're going to use cryptography to do this. We're going to um, use cryptography to protect our communications, we're going to use digital cash, and so forth. And so this is a very interesting thought experiment. Um, the, the, um, there's, there's some people come at this with a kind of a dogmatic approach, like, you know, we could do this already, let's do this today, we ought to vote for a president who wants this, and so forth. That wasn't me. To me, it was a creative, a creative inspiration, like, you know, just the way, other ways using computer science, so I'm a computer science major. Um, and so it intrigued me to think, are there ways to use computer science to, to do things like money um, and contract like interactions in cyberspace. So that, that's basically what my inspiration was, is political thing, um, political aspirations, and a lot of people created this interesting creative problem to solve. And, yeah. And when did you in, kind of dive into law? In what part of your career? Um, so I had studied a little bit of law just in part of doing this when I came up, the ideas started coming up with ideas of smart contracts and so forth. I was reading contract law to see, you know, how much of this could be automated and this sort of thing. And I eventually decided, well, I really need to go to law school. And so I went, actually spent a, all, most of the money I earned in the dot-com bubble going to law school and <laughs> um, learning more about it. So, yeah. Then, on a very different, I mean, kind of, what is your biggest criticism in the public debate that we today have? My biggest criticism? Oh, well, there's all sorts of things. I don't know if there's the biggest one. Um, the people who think smart contracts are some AI magic wand that you can just wave it, or blockchain for that matter, is just some sort of magic wave wand that you can wave at a problem, some random problem, um, is kind of silly because um, blockchains are really directed at trust problems, um, and they're not directed at you know making more efficient database, for example, that has nothing to do with the blockchain. So that's one of my pet peeves. And the general thing, and this is in the block size debate too, about people who want to have Visa or PayPal type performance, when the whole fundamental trade-off here we made was, don't worry about performance. Computers or networks are preposterously cheap. Worry about security and integrity. Um, and do your security integrity through the computer protocol and not by calling the cops. And that gives you an incredible global power that you don't have with Visa, PayPal, or any of the other systems. But you have to make that trade-off. If you're going to obsess about transactions per second, you're inevitably going to weaken your protocol and you just won't, you might as well just go back to using Visa and PayPal. They've been doing this for a long time. And they've optimized the heck out of their systems and you're not going to beat that. <clears throat> Performance-wise, so I'm sure some of you have questions which you want to raise. Yes. Excuse me. May we ask you to use the microphone because okay. we've got people following us online. Hello. Um, I would like to to ask your thoughts about uh, the centralization risk um, in public blockchains when it comes to mining. Um, especially when they use proof of work as a consensus mechanism that may be already proof of stake, which uh, is intended by mm. Ethereum at the end of the year. So all of those produce centralization risk. Um, and proof of stake is a lot less tested in that regard than proof of work. We have a lot of experience with proof of work. Um, I like Ethereum's current proof of work algorithm, memory hard algorithm. And so I'm somewhat reluctant to see them switch to the much less tested proof of stake. And they've actually improved on Bitcoin's proof of work algorithm with their own. Uh, Bitcoin's proof of work algorithm um, 
is more likely to promote centralization than Ethereum's current proof of work algorithm because it's much more amenable to hardware optimization than a memory hard um, proof of work. But in general, and I wrote about this back in 1998, really any proof of work system is, is amenable to hardware optimization. It just turns out that memory hardness is, is um, less amenable to that than, than CPU. Um, so if I were Ethereum, I would at least intersperse proofs of stake with the occasional proof of work to prevent what's called long chain attack. And as for centralization risk, you get in a lot of um, speculations about economics that really are just speculations. Okay, can you say who you are, just and then for the other ones? Um, uh, Stefan Clauser from ETH in Zurich. Um, my question is about um, the oracles. I mean, the, the critical part of, of the smart contracts is the external data sources, and therefore we need the oracles. But uh, as I understood, it's quite hard to understand how to monetize oracles. I mean, there's oracles it, but there are not enough, enough oracles out there. What, what is the chest to do? Well, I mean, the oracles are a cost. Um, center. You're going to have to pay for price data or pay usually for your other data. And even if you get it for free, you're going to have to clean it up and so forth. So they're a cost center, and obviously your smart contract is going to have to produce more value than that cost to be viable. And so, well, I mean, my company is doing that. We have something that's incredibly valuable that depends on, on price data. Um, so oracles are, and there are, there are a few smart contracts. There are some pure things, such as an assurance contract. I. I talked to you about that don't depend on data. They're just based on adding up money that's put in. So, but yeah, the normal, more more common, um, probably the predominant, useful smart contracts will be based on, on more fallible data. My name is Andy Shabnil from the Weizmann Institute in Israel. Uh, I'm not so sure that uh, uh, your optimism about our ability to encode everything in smart contracts, or most of the things we want to encode, uh, is, uh, um, is correct. Uh, people had thought about uh, replacing the legal code by uh, programs for a long time. And there were various attempts to do it, and uh, using uh, all kinds of uh, formal logics, and it never uh, worked out because there are so many complications. Just to give you a small example, after 100 years, we still don't have a completely well-defined definition of what is a car accident. You know, insurance companies are supposed to pay you if you are involved in a car accident. Mm -hmm. But if your car was stationary, the car was being fixed in a garage, I can give you uh, lots of examples. Oh, I, yeah, I agree. That was the whole point of my claims adjustment example is that we don't know how to do claims and But you gave only one example yeah. where it works uh, perfectly, and this is a trivial example of the Kickstarter. Uh, yeah. Well, the condition is if uh, the sum is above a certain uh, threshold, then you, uh, you pay, yeah. otherwise you return the money. Do you really believe that uh, real contracts can be codified by programs to a level which will uh, uh, get rid of all those zillions of special cases and the need for lawyers to argue about them? Um, some of them can, and in some cases you will do it by um, falling back on the manual stuff when the automated stuff reaches a condition you didn't, didn't anticipate. And some of them will be like the assurance contract, they are inherently pretty simple and automatable. Um, most financial contracts, um, even though lawyers like to mess them up, they're really based on well-defined uh, mathematical and logical relationships that you can program into computers. So they won't be exactly the same as the traditional contract, and there may be a few edge cases that a lawyer would want to have in there that won't be in there. But in the vast majority of cases, it will work. It will be automated, so you're not um, calling up lawyers. It will work the same in Albania, in Russia, China, United States. And so you're, you're getting all this new capability at that cost, which is sometimes going to be a smaller cost of um, not taking into account so many edge cases. So it will be, they won't be exactly one-to-one -one match. Um, smart contracts are inspired by contracts. They'll have clauses that, that sometimes look a lot like traditional contract clauses, but in the end, the things that work on smart contracts 
will be somewhat different. So for example, the, the insurance example, as, as you and I both um, talked about, um, we, we don't know how to do claims adjustment and a lot of the other things in insurance right now. But one thing that's closer to reality that we might be able to do are things called parametric contracts. So for example, um, you define a drought condition, and Swiss Re and others are actually investigating these. You define a drought condition um, based on weather station data, and the certain weather station data is defined as being a drought. And you pay off the money based on whether that weather station data triggers the condition of drought, um, based on the formula that you read on and are running on the blockchain. And that can be fairly pure. That doesn't have a lot of the um, uncertainty about what is a car accident and so forth. Um, and another example of that is hotel bookings. Um, if there's a flood, you could get flood damage directly and, and go to the claims adjuster and hopefully they'll define it properly as a flood and water damage and so forth and give you your money. But a parametric contract would be hotel bookings where a hotel would buy um, the smart contract that if the hotel bookings in that town go down, and of course this relies on an oracle to accurately port hotel bookings, but assuming not, you can do that, and it's a lot simpler task, um, then you know, you'd expect hotel bookings to go down in a flood, even for people who haven't been flooded, because people you know, outside New Orleans, for example, here New Orleans has been flooded, we're not gonna go. And so hotel bookings all over go down, everybody loses business, and you get insured by uh, participating in this contract. So that's a kind of contract you'll be able to do global and worldwide with a lot lower cost, a lot less bureaucracy. But it's not the same as insurance, a very different thing. Um, so these will be complementary, and insurance isn't gonna go away anytime soon. Lucas uh, Weber from Investir. Is this one? Yes. Um, if you implement today uh, an escrow smart contract, what is the state of regulation around that? Because typically for an escrow, you would need like money laundering uh, stuff. You would need to have some sort of self-regulation as the as the agent. Mm -hmm. How does that work today? Is it is it legal? Well, your legal? best thing is to pick a good jurisdiction to do it in. You, we've got uh, well over 100 countries in the world. We've got cantons and states and provinces and other countries. There's a dizzying, dizzying, dizzying array of local laws and regulations. So um, it's, it's mind-numbing compared to the blockchain simple code, right? So the blockchain, and that just shows you just how incredibly many, many orders of magnitude cheaper and more efficient the blockchain code is than traditional law. That you have this dizzying, dizzying set of regulations um, varying in incredible ways all over the world about escrow and mediation. And you've got this very simple blockchain mechanism that works the same everywhere in comparison. So yeah, if you're going to spend your time worrying about, am I following this law and that law, and that scares you away from the blockchain, you're going to lose all those or many orders of magnitude advantages. Um, your best bet, so the philosophy at our com uh, company is follow the law, don't depend on it. And by follow the law, you know, one thing you can do is, you know, go around the world and find who has the most blockchain-friendly regulations and do business there. And if there are legal systems that are going to be hostile to the blockchain and are going to deprive us of this many several orders of magnitude gain we can get from it, you know, don't do business there. Um, so, yeah. Lukas right. <clears throat> Becher from Airbus. Um, do you think sidechains like Rootstock can make Ethereum obsolete or torture for sure? Well, Rootstock's definitely very interesting. I hope it succeeds because it would combine a more mature and less volatile cryptocurrency with uh, Turing complete smart contracts, like the best of both worlds. Um, as far as I know, though, they're still relying on an Oracle like system, um, an M out of N system to bridge the gap for long term mm. wealth on each side. And so, and that's a little like private blockchains. It, it could become a cartel, it's a permissioned group thing of identified people. So, yeah, for some things you can use that for, but it's not, it's, you're not gonna get the capabilities of a full public blockchain that way. But I hope they can solve that problem and make it more trust minimized. It would be great. Thank you. Uh, 
uh, Mike from Investire. Um, I would like to understand your view, what, which traditional industry or process is most threatened by the use of blockchain? Um, so the financial industry is uh, fairly um, prone to disruption. Um, because you've got this really low-cost, global, secure, works the same everywhere financial vending machine versus these really local, silo-based, call the cops, piles and piles of papers of bureaucracy. Um, so it's really no contest on cost and security and integrity. So what they're going to argue is, that it's, oh, we can do more transactions per second, which, you know, costs pennies, right? Micro pennies. Um, so they're saving pennies at the cost of thousands and millions, or in the case of J.P. Morgan hack billions. So it's an incredibly false economy that they're, they're um, perpetrating, and they're really prone to disruption. But they are going to try to use the legal system to coerce people and protect themselves. So. I mean, to be honest, couldn't have had a better word for the end of your the discussion in the sense we're facing immense disruption because there is a new technology which is completely scaled obviously and this makes it so exciting we're at the start of a revolution and lots of questions have to be tackled and lots of work is required so really thank you and you know let's have some drinks and enjoy it thanks very much for coming